Ah, timelines. Where would we be without them? As we all know, the fragile human mind has immense difficulty wrapping itself around such a strange concept such as time. As far as we can tell, it flows along in linear progression, so timelines make sense when we want to organize certain events. This is the case for both reality and fiction, and my fiction certainly abides by this rule. Though it's taken some time, I finally managed to pin down the overarching timeline of my lore, which now spans over a million years in total length. For both my convenience and the convenience of others, I have separated it into five distinct epochs that I'll be explaining in depth over the course of this video. Before I actually get into that, however, let me put things into perspective by explaining where all this is taking place. Most of my lore takes place in the local group, specifically an area of the local group referred to as the Cluster. This is just a nickname for the Triangulum, Andromeda, and Milky Way galaxies together, as these galaxies are where all of the major civilizations and interesting events happen to appear. Andromeda and Triangulum will be serving as the first focal points of the lore, so let's jump right into the first epoch. Void Epoch. Sounds scary, doesn't it? That's because it is scary. The Void Epoch takes place over a million years before the dawn of mankind, when intelligent life in the cluster is sparse and mysterious, aside from a few unique ageless entities. During this time, the dominant life forms of the cluster are the Lapidus and Tuoctolo, who are essentially inverses of each other. The Lapidus are bright and colorful, while the Tuoctolo are dark and spooky. I'd love to tell you more about their respective biology, societies, and technology, but I don't have any of that information. Nobody does. Both of these civilizations are so ancient that virtually nothing of them remain after they mysteriously disappeared. It is known that they were quite powerful, both of them possessing colonies in all three galaxies at the same time. It is also known that they were both at war, possibly with each other, or possibly with an outside contender. The Lapidus fought using ultra-advanced precision laser weapons, and the Tuoctolo fought by building spooky super weapons to destroy their enemies' minds, build fantastic warships, and do... whatever this is supposed to do. I don't know, it's like a portal or something. Oh yeah, some Neosurfiates show up during this time too. What are Neosurfiates? Just a bunch of creepy godlike aliens from beyond the local group that spend their time killing off civilizations for fun. One Neosurfiate tribe, Pink Two Trillion, happened to pass by the cluster during this time, deciding to kill any intelligent life they could find for some cheap laughs. If the Tuoctolo and Lapidus didn't kill each other, Pink Two Trillion was sure to have finished them off. Soon enough, they got bored of destroying things, left the local group, and everything was lovely once again. Wonderful. The Ice Epoch is a bit calmer and cooler. After Pink Two Trillion left, not much else happened for quite a while. Half a million years pass uneventfully, and then, around 500,000 BCE, the Surfiads emerge. These huge tentacled things are some of the most intelligent and powerful creatures to ever emerge. They dominated the cluster for about 100,000 years, until another neo surfiad tribe came along and attacked. This time it's Red Six Trillion, a much older and stronger tribe than Pink Two Trillion. They went to war against the Surfiads, and lost. Well, they didn't lose in the sense that they got destroyed, they instead got trapped in a pocket dimension by Tyzax, an ethereal cyborganic entity created by the Surfiads as the ultimate anti-Neo-Surfiad weapon. Surfiad civilization was left in ruins, but at least the Neo-Surfiads had been stopped. The surviving Surfiads gathered together and said, Hey guys, this Tyzax thing we created, we have to make sure we can keep it safe so that it can keep Red Six Trillion trapped in their pocket dimension until the heat death of the universe or something. The other Surfiads agreed, and created the Zetylians the very first humanoid life forms in the cluster. They plopped the Zetylians down on Zetailu, where Tyzax's weird space tomb was buried, and made them super xenophobic by default so they wouldn't hesitate to destroy anybody that came too close to Tyzax. The Surfiads decided everything looked okay, and then died out, ending the Ice Epoch. Why is it called the Ice Epoch anyway? Because Surf, the Surfiad homeworld, was an icy planet, and the Surfiads liked ice a lot. And also because... Uh... Alright, Carbon Epoch. This is my second favorite epoch of Entropy Slaves, and it's because of one word. TECHNOLOGY! Oh my God. The technology featured in the Carbon Epoch is pretty weird and imaginative, and it's thanks to, you guessed it, another war. Let's pick up where we left off. 
The Serfians are dead, and the Zetalians are chilling out in their space empire, blowing up any ships unlucky enough to pass by their colonies. Things go well for a while, until about 300,000 BCE, when they destroy a fleet of black and orange spacecraft. Unbeknownst to the Zetalians, those ships belong to the last people you want to upset. The Kaolian Empire, aka the most powerful civilization to ever emerge in the Triangulum Galaxy, heard that their exploration vessels had been attacked, and they got mad. A war started between them and the Zetalians, the legendary First Cluster War. It was long and brutal, but in the end, the final victor turned out to be... nobody. Both the Zetalian hegemony and Kaolian Empire collapsed at the end of the war, so there wasn't a clear winner. Hey, I'm someone watching the video, and I was just wondering, when are you gonna talk about the humans? We're in the lore, right? Oh, of course. I haven't forgotten about the good old Homo sapiens. In fact, I've actually sought to relieve some disputes. Did you know that we actually are the products of intelligent design? But not at the hands of some old guy in a robe. During the first cluster war, the Kaolians got a brilliant idea to help deal with all the losses they were facing. They tried to create their own slave race of Zetalians to fight for them. The results were less than satisfactory. Aside from a single perfect clone, all I got were a bunch of mutant Zetalians that were considerably weaker and less intelligent than even a normal Zetalian. That's us, by the way. The Kaolians gave up and said, you know what, let's just put these space apes down on this watery planet here. I'm sure they won't do anything interesting. Also, the first cluster war ended around 200,000 BCE, which is about the same time that anthropologists say we humans emerged on Earth. Coincidence? I think not! The Steel Epoch is essentially just an intermission, taking place in the 200,000-something years between the fall of the Kaolian and Zetalian civilizations and the rise of the humans. Contrary to popular belief, quite a bit happens in this epoch. The second largest interstellar civilization to appear in the Milky Way galaxy, the Slin Combine, emerges during the later period of this epoch, incorporating seven different alien species through diplomatic means, and an additional two through war. Though it lasted several tens of thousands of years, it didn't achieve all that much due to internal corruption, struggles against other minor civilizations, and a series of extremely aggressive pathogens that killed off several species of intelligent life. Eastward along the Perseus arm, the Marinian Concordia is just getting off of its feet. They aren't doing anything right now, but we'll check in on them a little bit later. Meanwhile, the Slin Combine was using its newly developed- Oh, wait a minute. Is that the cowbell? Well, we all know what the cowbell means, right? What, you, you don't know? It means that Nri just woke up from one of its god sleeps. This ageless technology-collecting entity has been napping for the last 50 million years or so, and now it's reawakened inside its creepy space cathedral in Maltukpi to seek out new ways of upgrading itself. It'll stick around for a hundred thousand years or so, and then enter another fifty million year long god sleep. So go talk to it while it's still awake. Anyway, the Slin Combine dies eventually because it sucks, and the Steel Epoch ends. Also, it's called the Steel Epoch because the Slin likes steel. Moving on. Finally, we arrive at the Cobalt Epoch, my favorite, for the sole reason that it features some of the most peculiar creatures to ever walk among the stars. Humans! After we almost nuked ourselves into oblivion during World War III, the Americans, the Russians, the Japanese, and the Chinese all got together and said, hey guys, we just covered Earth in nuclear fallout and chemical residue during World War III, and now we are the only surviving remnants of human civilization. Let's band together and not die out, even though the latter would be much easier to do. The countries reluctantly agreed and formed the Humanity Doctrine, which was a super weak government that tried to keep people from killing each other until a more permanent solution could be put into place. That solution came in the form of contact with a new race of aliens, the Vakuri. Back during the later years of the First Cluster War, the Vakuri were unlucky enough to be right in the middle of all the fighting, and had their interstellar empire destroyed. They did reappear during the Steel Epoch, but nobody really cared. Now they've got humanity on their side, and they're ready to conquer the stars. And they did! They conquered a bunch of stars, and incorporated some new alien races to boot. They didn't know it at the time, but their partnership with humanity would give rise to the one and only Coalition of Intelligent Organisms. Now that the Coalition exists, it can get down to business. It absorbs some minor civilizations, wins a war or two, and experiences a lengthy societal regression, followed by a revolution, that reinvigorates the economy, triggering a new golden age. 
What happened to the Marinians? Not that much, actually. The Coalition fought them because they wanted their cloaking technology, and because they really had nothing better to do. But nobody won. A little bit later, a rebel group from the Coalition fought them for the exact same reasons. But again, nobody won. At this point, though, the Marinian Concordate was very old, hobbling around on a cane. So it was only a matter of time before it collapsed. The Coalition eventually expands out of the Milky Way galaxy and fights a war with some robots and some clones. That never really goes anywhere, so they all just decide to stop fighting and make a defensive federation, which is okay for about a millennia. Near the end of the epoch, Tyzax dies because of course it does, Red Six Trillion pops back into existence, kills everyone, and then gets killed off by Nri and its followers. Let's review. The Void Epoch was all about the spooky Tuaklo and Twinkly Lapidus doing some stuff, and dying. The Ice Epoch was about the Surfians doing some stuff, and dying. The Carbon Epoch was about the Zetylians and Kaolians doing some stuff, and dying. The Steel Epoch was about the Slin Combine doing some stuff, and dying. And the Cobalt Epoch was about humanity doing some stuff, and dying. TLDR, everyone died and nothing mattered. But at least there were some cool space wars. Is there anyone that doesn't die? Nri doesn't die, and neither do its servants, the Nephilim. There were probably a few minor civilizations that survived, perhaps spawned from larger empires. A couple of weird AI things survive, if you count them as living things. Quite a few survivors, actually. See? My lore isn't all doom and gloom. Good stuff can happen, too. Of course, none of them actually do anything significant, but perhaps it is reassuring to know that intelligent life will continue to exist even after the death of most major civilizations. Or, perhaps not. <laughs>